Um, uh, LA and I, on behalf of the project team, want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, we know time is precious these days, so we really do appreciate uh, your attention and consideration to such an important topic. Um, so this evening, we're going to hear from three experts in family law um, on uh, the connections that we see between poverty and family violence, uh, particularly in the family law context. Just as an online um, etiquette reminder, uh, if you're not speaking, we're going to uh, mute ourselves just to cut down on some of that background noise. So, um, all right, uh, before we begin, however, we do like to just take a moment to uh, reflect on the lands on which uh, you find yourself situated. I'm fortunate enough to sit on the banks of the Lewistiqui River. In fact, I can see it from my window. Um, and this is a territory named for that river. Um, and the Malisi, Lewistiqui people, as well as the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy tribes and nations signed peace and friendship treaties in this region with the British Crown in the 1700s. But you may be sitting on other traditional territories. So this is just one of those moments to reflect on what that territory is and to uh, experience some gratitude um, for the kind of work um, that we're allowed to do here um, and quite frankly need to do as part of an ongoing obligation to those communities and those treaty obligations. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker this evening who I've had the pleasure of listening to uh, before, so I know you won't be disappointed. Uh, Lindsay Manuel comes to us um, with both a Bachelor of Science and a law degree, and she's worked for the Women's Equality Branch since 2009. Uh, she's a senior advisor working with a number of areas of relevance to our work this evening, which include the MB Silent Witness uh, Project, as well as IPV intervention training and some consultation on that IPV Intervention Act. Um, however, I suspect there are some other aspects to her work she'll speak with us uh, about this evening. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen in order to give um, Lindsay Slides a chance to pop up, but I do want to uh, ask all of us to welcome uh, Lindsay in this stunted online context. <laughs> um, but we are very pleased to have you and you have to imagine just a chorus of applause at this moment now. I can um, hear it in my head right now. Perfect. <laughs> so I am so happy to be here and I'm really pleased with the interest that's taken in the intersection of poverty and intimate partner violence, because it does have a profound impact on people. And I also think the land acknowledgement really speaks to the fact and give us, gives us the opportunity to pause and think of the impact of colonization, particularly where it comes to domestic and intimate partner violence and how it has contributed to that. So, so I think it's really important that you're able to set that context for us. So thank you. Okay. And I'm not sure, is my slide, are my slides up yet? Not, not yet, I don't think. Okay. okay, good. It wasn't just me then. <laughs> no. And so... For those joining us that don't actually know me, so one thing I do like to share about myself is that I am visually impaired, so I'm legally blind, and I like to share that. So, you know, not only do I have a perspective of a white woman who is, but who's also someone that has faced some challenges being visually impaired. So although I do have a colonial lens as that has been my lived experience, I do come with a bit of diversity as well. And I like to share that because although I might not always see the slides, I will tell you that I can hear eye rolling regardless of where it comes from. Okay, so the first thing I really want you to notice 
is that I have included something from the Canadian Women's Foundation. So it's the sing signal for help. They introduced this during the pandemic because we know that the pandemic has had a profound impact on women and victims of intimate partner violence. All of those messages of stay home to stay safe weren't safe for everyone. So if you've not seen it before, that symbol to ask for help is when someone holds their hand up and puts their thumb across and traps their thumb within their hand. So it's to let people know that they need help. It doesn't necessarily mean call 911 right away, but it means to reach out and see how one can help them. And there is more information on the Canadian Women's Foundation website about how we should really respond to that. So when we're talking about intimate partner violence, we often think about physical violence. That's something that's easy to see. We see a black eye, we see a broken bone, but we can't forget that that's just the tip of the iceberg. That is what we see. But there are so many other forms of intimate partner violence going on at the same time, like physical violence, which is, is are the things that are really under the criminal code, the hitting, the punching, the beating up, the breaking of bones and whatnot. But we can't forget about the emotional and, psycho and psychological violence and that gaslighting that exists within that, that really impacts a woman's or a victim's ability or makes them question if they're able to sense reality and they often question their own mental health. And there's also sexual violence, financial abuse, spiritual abuse and stalking. So, it's not just about one type of violence that we might see, but we need to think about the cumulative, cumulative effect of many different forms of violence. And about one third of women are impacted by domestic and intimate partner violence throughout their lives. So it does impact a considerable number of people. And we also know that those that are two-spirited LGBTQ plus I, IA plus, they experience at least that same amount of intimate partner violence, but in reality, it is probably higher and that will probably come to light with more research. So to look at what poverty is, I just wanna lay the context of what poverty is in Canada. We know that the poverty line really is defined as half of the median family income or household income. And that means there's 3.7 million Canadians living in poverty. And when we look at New Brunswick, we can go to the next slide. We can see that impact within New Brunswick there's at least 100,000 people in New Brunswick living in poverty. About 18,000 of those are living in deep poverty. And people often wonder, well, what is actually that line, that number amount? Well, it's about $30,000 for a single person in New Brunswick. About $37,000 for a family of three. But deep poverty is, is quite impactful for many people. And can you imagine living with $11,000 a year? It would be very difficult. And think of our minimum wage in New Brunswick at $11.75. So if someone worked 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year at minimum wage, they make about $24,000. To actually reach the poverty line, they would need to work just over 50 hours a week 
for 52 weeks a year. Poverty impacts more people than we know. It's about one in 10 people. You know, it, it's not just poor people, it's the working poor as well. It's people that have been impacted by life changes and challenges and whatnot. And we, in the context of the pandemic right now, and the impact of it on people's jobs. Many people that have worked in the service industry, they have lost their jobs and many of those individuals have been women. We also need to look at inflation lately. Now we go to the gas station and we're paying crazy prices for gas right now. Well, I'm very fortunate, I'm very blessed that I complain about it the cost of gas, but I'm not forced to make a choice between having gas in the vehicle so I can go to work or having food on the table for myself and my children. But those are many decisions that people are forced to make. So if we go to the next slide, I want you to just think about what do we hear about poverty? And I'm trusting that many people in this virtual space are probably conscious of our own biases. We recognize the need to be empathetic and recognize their challenges and barriers, but not everyone has that mindset. So we still hear things that people that live in poverty, oh, they're lazy. We hear them referred to as welfare bums. We hear people complain about someone that might be dirty or smell bad. And they're not even thinking about what has brought that person to that place in their life. I have heard people say, well, a bar of soap only costs a dollar. Anyone can afford that. They haven't considered that someone that is more concerned about trying to feed their family or they're hungry or they're traumatized, that maybe they don't have the ability to get on a bus, go to the grocery store, the dollar store, wherever. There's no one to mind their children. It might be eight o'clock at night. That is not the priority for them and their family to survive. We also hear things about, about their clothing. It's, it's very difficult for people in poverty to, to have some of the things they need. I've also heard people say when they've walked by someone who's panhandling, well, I'm not going to give them money because look, their sneakers cost more than mine. And they haven't even thought of the fact that maybe this is a transgender youth whose family has just kicked them out because they are transgender. So we need to sometimes check our own biases and we need to remind others who have biases that this isn't a choice that people are making to live in poverty. There is no child that says, when I grow up, I hope I'm poor. These are really some unfortunate circumstances. Some of these things are intergenerational. We know that often the richest people pass their wealth to their family. Well, sometimes the poorest people pass their poverty to, onto their family as well because they don't have the opportunities to change what is happening in their life. And many of these individuals have suffered some sort of trauma. And sometimes it can be challenging for us when we're working with individuals with trauma because it does impact their behavior and can also impact their ability to maybe recount a story, remember what happened, seek help. Trauma has an impact and 
if we can be more trauma informed and take that into consideration, maybe we won't be saying, oh, they're just so angry all the time, they do nothing to help with their case or nothing to help them get better or seek other alternatives. Maybe at that time, they don't have the ability to do that. Maybe they're angry because of the trauma they've experienced and they've had really negative experiences with different systems. So I just wanted to make sure we could all just take a pause and think about what our bias is, what is out there about poverty and how it impacts the way we might provide support and help to others. Okay, we will go on to groups. And these are groups that are overrepresented in poverty. We know that many Indigenous people, many people with disabilities, female single parent homes, women and other gender minorities, racialized communities, and newcomers to Canada. Are these groups of people, are they just not as smart as the rest of us? Are they not capable of working and learning and making a living? Absolutely, they are capable of doing all of those things, but many haven't had the opportunity because they faced some systemic racism, systemic discrimination, and the opportunities have not been there for them. So they have traditionally been underpaid, underemployed, and, and often have had to rely on some kind of social assistance program to help them through. You know, that social safety net that we have in Canada that's meant to help individuals. But many of these have faced have faced barriers. And some of those barriers are intergenerational. And when we look at the impact of poverty, so if we go to the next slide, this is specifically the impact of poverty on domestic and intimate partner violence. And the impact I really wanna focus on right now is that the more poverty generally the more domestic and intimate partner violence that's likely to happen. There's a, a number of research studies in the States and in Canada that show that when families or couples experience food and economic insecurities over the last two years, domestic and intimate partner violence increases. We know that when there's periods of unemployment, domestic and intimate partner violence numbers increase. When there's downturns of the economy, again, it increases. When there's economic stressors on families, domestic and intimate partner violence increases. So poverty can be hard enough to live with, and then you add domestic and intimate partner violence onto that. It's very challenging for people living in poverty to access some of the services that many of us take for granted. But it's not just dealing with poverty. So we can go to the next slide. It's the barriers that it causes. So there's barriers to accessing services and there's barriers to, to employment, to programs to help change someone's life. Things like housing. Is there enough affordable housing in New Brunswick? No. We have heard on the news all of the time are incredibly low vacancy rates. We have heard about people being evicted, the renovictions and 
other companies buying their apartments and increasing the rents to where people can't afford them. We know that domestic and intimate partner violence is one of the leading causes of homelessness for women and their children. If you don't have a safe, affordable place to live, what are your options? Are you going to couch surf with your two or three children? Are you going to live in your car with your two or three children? Or do you sometimes have to make the choice to stay with the abusive partner? Because that's the only choice that you see right now. And sometimes that makes victims even more hesitant to reach out for help and support because they're afraid that if anyone knows, if any service provider knows that they're still with their abusive partner, that they risk possibly losing their children because we know that children who are exposed to domestic and intimate partner violence, that can be considered child abuse. And it makes sense because we know there are very negative consequences for children. But rather than punish the mothers, we need to be able to hold the abusive partners who are perpetrating the violence more accountable. So there's unemployment. Many people lack the qualifications or the education to be able to access employment. Many people living in poverty don't have the opportunity to go out for a job interview because they can't afford to either get there, they can't afford to have someone watch their children while they go for that interview. And speaking of watching children, it is expensive to pay for childcare if you're trying to work. So that can be a barrier for many victims who are living in poverty. There's also the discrimination and stereotyping. We see it all the time. Um, as someone with a disability, I recognize that discrimination is out there. And I recognize that it can be more of a challenge for someone to hire someone with a disability because they think it's gonna be so much more work. And you know what? It can be more work. I do require other things. But unless I'm hired, they don't know what I can provide and that it's actually worth it. You know, we hear stereotypes that, oh, Indigenous people, you know, their alcohol use, their, you know, they don't want to work, different things like that, which is not true. But when people perpetuate those stereotypes, it makes it more difficult for those individuals to achieve and reach things and, um, and be treated fairly. There's also for many people the fear of the police. They might have had negative experience with the police or other aspects of the justice system or our social system. And then there's also complex challenges that many victims of domestic and intimate partner violence face. And one of those is poverty, but there's mental health issues. There can be addictions issues. And I just want to mention that with addictions issues, some people think the addictions lead to poverty and lead to domestic and intimate partner violence. Whereas sometimes using drugs and alcohol might be maladaptive coping strategies. It might not be the most healthy coping strategy, but it is a coping strategy and these people are surviving using it. So addictions and mental health does play a factor. Okay. I think we can go to the next slide. Oh, we already did. Perfect, thank you. So I just wanted to mention intersectionality. So this was something that Kimberly Crenshaw had coined a number of years ago. And it's really looking at the fact that all of these barriers and challenges and 
disadvantaged groups, we can't look at things as separate challenges. It is not that someone is only dealing with poverty and oh, being a newcomer to Canada is a totally different issue. We need to recognize that these intersectionalities overlap, these challenges overlap and they're cumulative. It's not, it makes it much more complex to deal with. And so imagine if you're an individual who is poor, but is also indigenous, maybe has a disability, maybe is a single parent. So say we had a newcomer that was of Asian descent and they came and they were working a minimum wage job. So we know they're not making a lot of money they might be supporting their children. They might have left their country of origin because of the trauma they experienced there, whether it was sexual violence or other trauma. Now they come here, they're struggling, working minimum wage jobs. They're told by others that they're working with, go back to where you come from, stop stealing our jobs. They might not speak the language. They can't further their education. There are so many more barriers that when we stack one thing on top of the next, it, face, it makes significant challenges. Okay, so there are some supports out there that can provide services for victims of domestic and intimate partner violence and that are dealing with other challenges such as poverty. I would highlight the domestic violence sector, really incredible individuals, including domestic violence outreach workers, second stage housing, which provides safe, affordable, uh, supportive housing for victims and their children, and also victims alone in transition houses that provide emergency uh, services and housing for up to 30 days. There's also the Department of Social Development, that has social assistance, affordable housing, and household setup funds, which in um, certain cases, they will provide $2,000 to help someone get set up in their uh, new apartment or residence. There's employment programs. There's employment insurance that some people might not be aware that they're entitled to. And I put these out there because we don't need to be the experts on everything. But sometimes when we're dealing with someone, they might not know these services exist. We might need to go the extra mile to make sure they have the same opportunities as other people to access services that they may need. So we can go to the next slide. I did want to mention this about the risk of lethality. There are some things specific to poverty that can increase the risk that a victim will be killed or seriously injured by their intimate partner. And one is that leaving an abusive relationship, whether it's a they've told their partner, they've just left, that is one of the riskiest times for a victim of intimate partner violence that the majority of deaths have happened during that time. And, but sometimes they don't have housing, so they return to the abusive partner. So they're still in that increased level of risk. And we need to recognize that, that there needs to be safety planning when people are leaving so they can do it in a safer way. Also unemployment, the abuse of partners unemployment increases that risk of lethality. And the coercive and controlling aspects of many relationships does elevate that risk too. And we see that often these are when the abuse of partners have lost control of the situation and they're escalating their violence to regain that control over their partner.
This is a shield text from the Silent Witness Project. I'll give you all just a moment to take a look at it and read it to yourselves. And I wanted to bring this one forward because there are many stories of the New Brunswick silent, witness, silent Witnesses. And this one I think really spoke to this, not just this topic, but the legal system and domestic and intimate partner violence. So Michelle Renault was trying to do what she thought she should do to be able to leave this relationship. She consulted a lawyer, they sent her partner a letter um, offering to buy him out. He was angry that he didn't know where she went and he ended up killing her. So we need to recognize that even though we're following maybe the right course of action, that can escalate the risk to victims. So if we go to the next slide, that escalation of risk really mean, needs some sort of safety management. And again, we don't expect everyone to be experts on this, but there are experts on safety management and you can help connect these victims with those that can provide that safety. If we go to the next slide, I have some resources for safety planning and the domestic violence sector, the domestic violence outreach transition has a second stage. They're all very um, well informed about safety planning. Public legal education, they have safety plans on their website that anyone can use. There's also legislations that can help promote safety in the Employment Standards Act. There's now provisions for domestic violence leave. And under the Residential Tenancies Act, there's also early termination of a leave in situations of domestic and intimate partner violence. And there's also emergency intervention orders that can provide remedies to victims of intimate partner violence that can enhance their safety. So if we go, I think that is it for me. Yes. So I thought the EIOs really leads well into what Chantal is going to share with you about legal aid services. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I'm <clears throat> really, uh, you start, that was a heavy hitter there at the end. <laughs> so I think oh. I was still, um, still sitting with some of that, but um, it's just the way in which you're able to bring nuance and complexity to that, the one word of poverty, I think is essential. Um, and much of the work that we've discovered over the course of the project demonstrates the ways in which um, the, uh, well, just those, the, that family law and, and family violence are um, intersectional and complex for many reasons. So it's, we re I really appreciate that. And I agree, it's going to uh, lead in quite well, I think to um, our next um, speaker. So just really, um, just fascinating here with my tech savvy, just going to be amazed. And I really should have warned people beforehand about the silent witness shield, because it is triggering to some. So I apologize for that. Um, no, 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 it is not hard at all. to hear. Um, uh, okay, so um, it is, uh, we're going to keep moving along here just in the interests of time, um, although I know there's a, likely many questions, but um, we may have an opportunity at the end to address some of those, uh, but we want to give an opportunity to our other speakers, uh, most notably beginning now will be uh, Chantal Landry, who's coming to us um, uh, with both a Bachelor of Arts and uh, Law Degrees. Um, and uh, she acts as a Director of Family Law Services and Public Trustee for the New Brunswick Legal Aid Services Commission. And um, this, uh, 
<laughs> slide and our poster um, actually gave Chantel fewer years experience than she <laughs> has. She has a whole other decade to add on to those years of experience, but I think it must just be your the youthful air about you um, that led us to this era. So uh, nearly three decades of experience. Um, we're just uh, pleased um, to invite Chantal to speak with us today, and so I will turn the floor over to her and again thunderous applause i'm sure you can hear it virtually um and uh i will give um i'm not sure who's doing it but someone's going to oh you're I, sharing your apparently i'm doing it myself so you're, you're hopefully the wheel. <laughs> i won't have any uh major barriers in presenting my my slideshow but uh thank you everybody for inviting us tonight uh thank you lindsay that was an amazing uh, introduction to this very important topic. Um, I, my part of this conversation will focus mostly on the legal remedies uh, and speaking about what we at Legal Aid can offer um, a client who is coming to us and seeking help when they have been victim of domestic violence. So I'll, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I hopefully of it. So uh, what I wanted to talk to this group about is what we have um, available in New Brunswick uh, for legal remedies for victims of domestic violence in family court. And I will touch a little bit about the connection with clients who are actually poor clients or live in poverty and, and, and face certain barriers to access these legal remedies. Um, I will be sp speaking mostly about the civil remedies available. I'm recognizing that there are obviously uh, remedies under the criminal code when victims can go through that process in order to obtain some kind of um, uh, relief. Uh, but for tonight's purposes, I'll, I'll focus more on the civil remedies. So, and I apologize, I know I should, I should do this as a slideshow, but um, I can't seem to find a button to do so. So we'll speak about uh, the Intimate Partner Violence Intervention Act that's uh, in New Brunswick currently, and actually is fairly new to our province because it was uh, only uh, in effect in 2018. So even if it's been a couple of years, it seems like COVID, the two years of COVID was like a flash and, and everything before that was, is quite recent. Um, and also about our services that we offer at the Legal Aid uh, Services Commission. So under the Intimate Partner Violence uh, Intervention Act, um, that's been in effect, as I said, since May 2018 in New Brunswick. Um, it allows applicants to obtain an emergency ex parte order within 24 hours of application. And um, the, you know, the, the convenience of this legislation, it allows uh, these individuals to obtain uh, or to make an application by phone. Uh, there is no financial eligibility requirement to obtain uh, this service, um, as well as uh, they must contact, however, one of the following service providers in order to make the application to what we consider, uh, what we call hearing officers here in New Brunswick. So the client themselves don't make the applications, but they make it through either police officers, victim services program, transition home, second stage home, the domestic violent outreach workers, social workers within the Department of uh, Social Development, and uh, one of the reasons, of course, that those individuals were by regulation designated as the um, making those applications is that this service is available on a 24 uh, hour basis. So uh, it, uh, it, it allowed the service to be presented by individuals who typically are all already working. Um, a shift work around the clock. Uh, what can be requested in an intervention or uh, emergency intervention order is uh, the temporary custody of children. Um, they can also have the temporary order prohibiting contact between uh, the respondent or the accused uh, of domestic violence uh, and with the victim and or the children, temporary exclusive possession of uh, the family home, uh, temporary, peri, temporary, excuse me, possession of some of the property they might not use, they might need at the time, uh, like a vehicle, for example, uh, prohibition uh, that the respondent uh, not shut off any of the basic utilities of the home, uh, which we often have heard about in the past, you know, was one way of punishing the, the victim uh, if they left the home and it, they just wouldn't pay for the utilities. 
uh, can also uh, be a prohibition against destruction of property, seizure of weapons, removal of respondent from the property, and then provisions requiring the respondent to stop further acts of intimate partner violence. Uh, so there is a wide array of remedies available. Um, this legislation is meant to be what we would consider a temporary fix, an immediate temporary fix for victims of violence, um, because he, obviously prior to having this legislation in place, what we had was the Family Services Act, uh, in which point we could obtain what were called ex emergency ex parte orders for victims, but that still required them to make an appointment with the lawyer and make uh, apply to the court. So the access to the service, uh, although could be done fairly quickly, obviously this system works much more expeditiously for them. Um, the, the legislation provides for a these orders to be in place for only up to a maximum of 180 days. As I said, it is meant to be a, a very immediate remedy to uh, provide safety to a victim of domestic violence and then give them a, a little bit of time to then go and consult lawyers uh, to apply to the court in a more formal fashion under our Family Law Act or under the Divorce Act to, to seek more permanent remedies. Um, our experience in New Brunswick, although the maximum is 180 days, and, and maybe Madam Justice Boudreau Dumas may, may speak to this, uh, our experience in New Brunswick is that our hearing officers are granting orders usually between um, 30, 60, maybe 90 days maximum. And one of the things that we have realized in New Brunswick that in the beginning that this act was being um, ap applied, uh, a lot of the orders, uh, the, the legislation provides for a review or a variation of an emergency intervention order. And a lot of people were bringing these matters, the respondents were bringing them to, to back to court for a variation because they were being prevented from seeing their children for possibly up to 180 days. And over time, um, it would appear that the hearing officers uh, wanted to impose just not the maximum amount of time because they knew that the family law courts would have to deal with the issue of access to children, even in cases of uh, domestic violence. Um, so we at, Le at Legal Aid um, offer another a variety of other services, but more for, for permanent nature, of course. Um, we are not, we don't provide the services at the outset for intervention orders, but we will deal uh, when clients apply to our services. We can deal with either varying these orders, extending them, and also then also bringing the client through the more formal um, applications to court uh, through our family law, now Family Law Act and Divorce Act. So the legal remedies available through our legal aid um, is that applicants have to apply to legal aid services through their local regional office by appointment with a intake officer. And um, uh, if any of you are familiar with legal aid services in your province, this is probably something similar. Um, forms have to be completed and signed and clients who meet the eligibility criteria are issued what is called a legal aid certificate, which then allows them to be assigned a specific lawyer to represent them. The interesting uh, positive effect, I think, of COVID-19 uh, was that it forced a lot of service providers us equally to rethink about how we had to offer services to our clients because obviously the face-to-face -face, uh, meetings were restricted for a greater part of it. So uh, at Legal Aid, we shifted our operations to make phone interviews with our clients in order to apply. And in fact, um, that has been a, a, of a benefit, a huge benefit for many of our clients who, uh, as you would appreciate, uh, the clients that apply to legal aid are clients who live in poverty for the most part or are working poor. So allowing them to have access to even apply to legal aid through something as simple as a phone service is really something that has enhanced their ability to be able to apply to our services. Um, and we plan on keeping that a service available even now that restrictions are being lifted for COVID-19. Um, 
in the family law spectrum of the legal aid services, uh, we cover a, a variety of services. Uh, in New Brunswick, is not as large as other provinces. Uh, obviously, always a, a question of resources. Um, but we will cover child protection matters. So we will represent the custodial parent, the parent who, uh, for the we have assessed that the children were remo removed from their care in this process. Uh, we will represent clients who qualify on custody access matters. Now we refer to them as parenting orders under our new legislation. Uh, we will deal with child support. Uh, we will deal with spousal support. We also offer other services such as duty counsel services, which is essentially free legal services um, at the courthouse during a hearing for an unrepresented parties in certain services. And we also uh, provide free services for a family advice lawyer, which is essentially a two hour um, consultation with a family lawyer in each of, in, in each of the judicial districts. Uh, essentially the client calls and uh, wants to receive con consultation on a family matter. Uh, oftentimes these are clients that wish to represent themselves and go to courts and they're, they're not quite familiar with the process. So this is a service that will assist them in uh, showing them what forms to use and what kind of information that they should be putting in those forms and or to review forms that clients have already um, filled out. Uh, so it's a great service and those two last services are free of charge. You do not have to meet any financial eligibility criteria for that. Um, so the next, uh, the, the, eligibility criteria, excuse me, for the New Brunswick Legal Aid Services Commission is both financial and in scope of service. Uh, so as I mentioned to you before, there, in family law, we only cover a certain um, spectrum of services and we don't cover things like division of property uh, or we won't cover um, a uh, domestic or a variation of spousal support. Uh, we only do the determination. Uh, we generally service a low income uh, population. Uh, and we'll, I'll show you later the, uh, the grids that we go by in order to qualify uh, clients that apply. And so we go um, by the type of service. So if a client comes to us and, and fits the scope of service of family services that we can uh, offer, uh, and they meet the financial criteria, then they will be qualified for a legal aid certificate. Um, so the parenting orders in New Brunswick uh, are for both parents. Uh, so it, we can uh, have both parents qualify for legal aid. So it's not a first come first serve. So you'll have the first parent that will come to us represent uh, and, and, and qualify for our services and they'll receive a staff, for example, staff services and any other parent will qualify and they will be referred to uh, an outside counsel who also do legal aid uh, certificate work for us. So we are a mixed model between staff lawyers and private bar lawyers. Um, as far as clients are concerned, um, especially when we're dealing with clients who um, have a lot of barriers, economic barriers to services and, and housing. Housing is something that Lindsay spoke about greatly. Um, you know, we do have the ability to request uh, restraining orders and to have exclusive possession of the home under the Family Law Act as well. And uh, therefore it just comes and entrenches even more uh, if the client had obtained previously an, in, um, an intervention order through the uh, other legislation. Uh, we have serviced uh, other members of the family uh, other than the parents. It all depends on whom the kids are living with. So at Legal Aid, if the children have been living with grandparents uh, for a significant period of time, they could in fact qualify for our services uh, under our, cer our uh, certificate service. Uh, variations of child support, again, we can represent either the payee or the payor. Uh, it all depends on who qualifies financially for the services, uh, as well as determining spousal support. Typically, it's available to the recipient of the spousal support in order to, um, uh, to, to be successful at obtaining legal aid services. 
in child protection uh, cases. And again, uh, these are cases um, where the Minister of Social Development is involved and whether they're asking just for a supervisory order or a custody order, uh, which is just a temporary apprehension or a final guardianship order, uh, we will represent the uh, parent for, from whom the primary care was taken from. Um, and uh, we issue a certificate to them uh, in regards to our services. Family Duty Council, I spoke to about a little bit briefly. Uh, it's a free service. It's available only uh, on a first appearance of matters that qualify. So it's typically provided to unrepresented parties where the other party is represented by legal aid and going to court or the other party is represented by the crown so it offers some free legal uh, advice to un unrepresented parties on understanding what the proceeding is in court that they're facing and what responsibilities or obligations that they have to meet in order to represent themselves oftentimes Duty Council will simply refer people to legal aid in order to apply for uh, uh, legal services. Um, under the previous legislation that I talked about, the Intimate Partner Violence Intervention Act, um, as I stated, it, part of the legislation allows for an order to be either reviewed by a court or um, the other party may seek to vary the order under that particular and uh, Legal Aid has made an agreement with the Department of Justice that we would provide family duty counsel for any unrepresented party who is facing uh, a variation request under that specific legislation. Uh, and the family advice lawyer I spoke to a little bit briefly, it's free of charge again to all residents. It, doesn't matter what your income level is. It's a two hour free session for any uh, New Brunswick resident who is looking to have some advice on a family matter. Now the cost of services for a uh, certificate is based on a grid and we basically go by the um, composition of the household as well as the uh, gross monthly income. We also have a grid with a gross uh, annual income. Um, and this, this grid will show you that, for example, if we have a household of three, so if you have a single mom with two children, um, if her monthly income is from zero to $1,900 per month, she will pay no contribution for her legal aid services. If that same individual uh, goes into the tier two category is between 1900 and 2900, then it's a one time $150 contribution, and so on and so forth. And so the maximum amount, uh, if you see from the grid for an individual who is uh, in a household of three, if you earn more than $46,000, $800 per year, you won't qualify for legal aid. Um, and it's unfortunate, I, you know, it would be nice if we could have larger grids for um, applications, because I know many of you would appreciate that at $46,000 a year with two children, uh, someone is going to be very um, challenged to afford the services of a private lawyer in order to bring their family court matter to court. Um, but despite the, uh, the grid that we have, we, you know, in family law, we represent approximately 4,000 clients per year in a small province like New Brunswick. So it's a, uh, it's a fairly substantial service. Um, and it also is a reflection of how many people are living uh, in, in a poverty state. The family matters that we don't cover at legal aid are uh, division of marital property, variation of spousal support, and or disbursements for capacity assessments. Um, there can be exceptions made. Uh, they are rare, but these are very costly. Uh, so we, are, we need to be very vigilant about uh, the use of our funding for those uh, particular matters. Uh, we have legal aid offices located in all the judicial districts of the province. Um, and I know I'm going very quickly, but I just want to make sure there's enough time for our next speaker. 
how to find us, uh, we have our website that gives us more detailed information about all the services that we provide um, at legalaid.juridic.nb.ca. So I will end it there. I know it was a very brief overview of the legal remedies uh, that are available. Um, there obviously could be a lot of discussion on the substantive uh, remedies that uh, the legislation allows in New Brunswick. Uh, but I think this would be a nice uh, segue into Madam Justice Boudreau Dumas' uh, conversation, who may be able to speak to us uh, uh, about her views from the bench. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chantel. Um, I'm really thrilled that you're able to share that, and it was really quite a rapid romp. Mm -hmm. uh, just a reminder that the webinar will be available on the Muriel, Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center website. So I think um, in the chat that was the link to that was put up already. And so if you wanted to review it, you can. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker and uh, I invited her because she herself has had uh, a very long standing experience with legal aid. Um, it gives her a, a unique uh, position to understand the nexus of poverty and, and domestic violence, both as from a lawyer's point of view and now from the bench. So I'd like to welcome Madam Justice Michelle Boudreau-Dumas as our, our final speaker. And I realize the time has crept up. We did start a bit late. Um, feel free to leave, you know, at your own convenience, but I think we will extend the time a little bit to allow her enough time to be able to share what she wanted to share. Uh, and just a reminder, there's the, you have your interpreter buttons down below. I believe Madam Justice Michelle Boudreau de Ma is going to be sharing in both English and French. So if you want to click on your preference, then you won't lose the thread of her, of her talk. So without further ado, Madam Justice Boudreau de Ma. Thank you, Mrs. Henry. Uh, for sure, I should have uh, taken your offer to go first because uh, going after uh, Mrs. Manuel and Mrs. Landry it, uh, it won't be easy at all, but uh, I will do my best. That's the only thing I can do. Uh, je vais uh, présenter, uh, comme Madame Henry l'a mentionné, dans les deux langues uh, officielles. Je vais alterner uh, d'une partie à une autre pour que ce soit plus facile pour uh, l'interprète. Et uh, je ne crois pas uh, avoir à prendre le, le 45 minutes ou quelques minutes qui, qui, uh, qui restent. Uh, J'espère d'avoir uh, du temps assez uh, pour uh, que les participants puissent se poser des questions, soit à Mme Manuel, à Mme Landry ou à moi-même. Uh, donc, uh, n'hésitez pas uh, lorsque ce sera le, le temps de, de poser des questions ou des commentaires. Ma présentation va surtout euh, être axée de mon expérience professionnelle euh, avec les femmes victimes de violence et la pauvreté. Euh, mon intérêt pour le droit de la famille euh, a commencé euh, très tôt, euh, même à l'école de droit. Euh, nous avions un, un mémoire un peu comme un, une thèse en troisième année. Et euh, mon sujet euh, à l'époque était la, la différence euh, au niveau des règlements de biens et de dettes pour les ententes de séparation s'il y avait de la violence domestique ou qu'il n'avait pas. Euh, C'est certain que je n'avais pas pu faire une recherche très exhaustive, euh, mais euh, avec mon expérience par la suite en tant qu'avocate en, en pratique privée, euh, j'ai pu euh, certainement constater euh, que souvent et malheureusement, euh, les femmes victimes de violences domestiques acceptaient moins euh, au niveau de règlement, euh, ou vous, vous l'acceptez moins au niveau de règlement euh, de biens de dette. Euh, puis même des fois aussi au niveau de, de soutien pour, euh, pour les enfants, euh, de soutien pour elles-mêmes. Euh, souvent, c'était pour soit avoir la, la paix ou qu'elles pensaient qu'elles pouvaient avoir la paix. Et d'autres fois, c'était pour euh, au niveau d'avoir plus le, le, de droits au niveau des, des enfants. Donc, j'ai pu un, un peu constater euh, en pratique euh, ce qui avait été démontré euh, avec euh, mon, mon projet euh, en troisième année. In the early 90s, I joined the legal aid family uh, and uh, I was uh, 
I had as a colleague, Mrs. Landry, uh, for several years. And after that, she was my supervisor. So uh, we have known each other for a long time. And uh, at, the, at the time that uh, the, uh, I, low, I, I uh, joined Legal Aid, it was at the, the same time as the provincial government reformed the domestic legal aid program. And the eligibility criteria at the beginning uh, to obtain services of a lawyer under the domestic legal aid program was that uh, you had to be a, a victim of domestic abuse or domestic violence. If not, other services were available through mediation, uh, but uh, to obtain the services of the lawyer, you had to uh, be a victim of abuse. Uh, so the information that we received to uh, pursue with the files uh, we obtained a lot of, of details uh, in, in relation to uh, the violence uh, that had been sustained by the victims during the relationship. And I would say that around 90% of the referred clients uh, were women at the time. And uh, the majority of them, even though it was not a, criteria, a financial criteria, the majority of them uh, were still uh, below the, uh, the poverty line. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, what could maybe explain that is that uh, you could not, as Mrs. Landry indicated, qualify with respect to the division of, of the property and debts under the legal aid program. So the, uh, the women that were more fortunate uh, who could uh, access a lawyer to have the property and debts um, issues taken care of would also uh, pursue with that lawyer with respect to custody and access and, and child support. Um, at the, the same time as the government uh, reformed the, the domestic legal aid program, uh, I, I noticed uh, that uh, several services um, or, or several courses or information or um, were uh, provided to service providers uh, with respect to uh, family violence so that the people uh, working uh, with the basically women and children uh, victim of abuse uh, would have a better understanding of the, the, the problem, I should say. En ce moment-là, vraiment, le, le gouvernement a, a mis en place euh, beaucoup d'autres programmes et initiatives euh, pour aider les, les professionnels et les autres personnes à, à mieux comprendre, si vous voulez, euh, la violence domestique. Dans ces années-là, euh, on a vu euh, qu'il y a eu du financement euh, accru pour les maisons de transition. Euh, on a vu aussi euh, où ce qu'il y a eu le, 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 la mise en place des, euh, des intervenants euh, pour aider les enfants victimes de violence euh, dans les maisons de transition encore. Euh, les travailleuses d'approche, out, outreach worker, euh, ça, ça n'a pas toujours été mis en place, ça a été à, avec les, les années. Il y a eu beaucoup de, de rapports puis euh, d'études de, de, euh, au niveau de la violence euh, domestique des femmes victimes de violence. Ça, on a vu ça beaucoup au, au cours des années euh, également. Euh, il y a eu aussi de mise en place des, des partenariats communautaires où tu avais les, les différents euh, intervenants euh, dans chaque région qui, qui se réunissaient pour essayer de... de d'avoir une meilleure coordination au niveau des, des services pour les femmes victimes de violence qui, en réalité, souvent étaient également des femmes avec moins de ressources qui étaient considérées plus pauvres, si vous voulez. En tant que, que membre et présidente du, de la Maison Notre-Dame, qui est la maison de transition pour femmes et, et enfants victimes de violence dans la région de, de Camelton, euh, j'ai également euh, pu voir d'un autre œil les services qui étaient offerts aux femmes victimes de, de violence, qui, encore une fois, la plupart du temps, étaient également des, des femmes moins nanties, avec moins de moyens. Euh, sous le seuil de la pauvreté, parce que plus souvent qu'autrement, les, les femmes qui avaient plus les moyens euh, n'avaient pas nécessairement, euh, n'étaient pas nécessairement obligées d'accéder à, 
aux maisons de transition. Euh, ce que j'ai, que, que j'espère, que, que, avec tous ces programmes-là, toutes les initiatives, que ça fait en sorte que le, 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 le fossé euh, entre les femmes qui avaient plus les, les moyens euh, et celles qui, qui vivaient en, dans, la, dans la pauvreté ou avec moins de moyens a pu euh, au moins euh, être moins important euh, à ce, ce niveau-là. Uh, during the course of the last, well, I should say maybe 20, 30 years, <laughs> um, because I, I, I came into the, the game, I was, uh, as, as Mrs. Nantley, we were, what, two years old? So we're not that old yet, right? <laughs> But uh, as women throughout the years have become uh, better educated, uh, worked more outside of the home, uh, I have seen, I have noticed that men became increasingly uh, implicated in, in childcare and at separation, uh, men wanted to continue to be more involved uh, in, in, um, in, in raising children. And while I, sh I, I cannot generalize, but uh, uh, I have noticed that, that trend throughout the years. Uh, so that has uh, created uh, some difficulties uh, for some women, uh, especially uh, victim of abuse, uh, where uh, that um, men wanting to be more involved and wanting either joint uh, custody now, uh, uh, decision making responsibility and more parenting time or equal parenting time a lot of, of the time that was, that was used and uh, caused even more stress and, and difficulties for the women uh, victim of abuse. Uh, as well, uh, the uh, eligibility criteria uh, with respect to uh, legal aid uh, changed to a, a financial criteria. And um, what I saw at the time uh, as a legal aid lawyer was that there was less emphasis uh, put on domestic violence or domestic abuse uh, or less information given to, to that effect. So uh, we would see, well, we would see less uh, because less what was uh, formulated to, to us. Um, on the same token, because it, there was not the necessity of, of abuse anymore, uh, we saw more men uh, who qualified uh, for, for legal aid and uh, we were referred the, these clients and there was not any inf uh, emphasis or a lot, lot less uh, put on family violence by the, the men. Uh, we would see more uh, incidents of violence whereas uh, abuse or a, a cycle or, or anything of that, uh, of that sort. Um, so, and, and we, what, what I, I, I would see as well is that there would be uh, incidents of violence by both or alleged uh, by both, uh, whether it be the, the women or the men. Uh, so that is, the, that is where uh, uh, I saw the, the situation as a legal aid lawyer before I was uh, named uh, to the bench. And it's uh, certain que au niveau de la perspective de la violence domestique uh, n'est pas la même uh, lorsque je, je représentais les clients uh, devant la cour uh, au niveau de, de l'avocat en, en tant que uh, à l'aide juridique et que maintenant uh, sur le banc. Uh, maintenant, je dois balancer uh, les, les positions des deux parties. Euh, en relation de, de la preuve qui est, qui est présentée devant le, le tribunal par chacun et la loi. Euh, plus, plus souvent euh, qu'autrement et, et très malheureusement, il euh, n'y a pas de témoin indépendant au niveau de, de la violence domestique. C'est plutôt difficile. Euh, donc, c'est plus une question de, de qui croire. He said, she said. Euh, ça, ça c'est très, euh, très difficile à, à pouvoir euh, déceler euh, tout au niveau de, de la violence euh, à ce niveau-là. Euh, 
euh, et ce n'est pas toujours facile de, de concilier aussi avec le fait que les, les, c'est un droit euh, des enfants d'avoir autant de contact avec un parent qu'avec l'autre. Certainement, c'est toujours au niveau du meilleur intérêt euh, de l'enfant, euh, mais euh, il reste qu'un homme peut être un conjoint abuseur sans pour autant être un mauvais parent. Des fois, ça va ensemble, mais pas toujours le cas. Euh, récemment, euh, je pense que c'est pour vraiment aider aussi à, à déceler au niveau de, de, de la définition du meilleur intérêt de l'enfant, puis aider à, à faire en sorte que la violence domestique soit euh, considérée de façon spécifique. Euh, il y a eu des changements au niveau de la loi sur le divorce et également la loi sur le droit de la famille ici au Nouveau-Brunswick, euh, qui fait en sorte que la, la violence domestique est définie, puis elle est, euh, elle est euh, inclue euh, dans le, la définition du meilleur intérêt de l'enfant. Donc, euh, s'il si y a une corrélation, euh, la Cour doit en prendre en considération, puis c'est certain que ça va avoir un effet au niveau euh, du... Euh, du montant de temps, par exemple, qu'un euh, parent pourra avoir avec les enfants, un parent abusif, si vous voulez. Ce que j'essayais de, de, de promouvoir euh, tout au long de, de, de ma carrière d'avocate et que j'essaie également euh, de faire euh, aujourd'hui, euh, c'est de, 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 de faire comprendre euh, directement même aux, aux femmes qui ont été victimes d'abus domestiques, du fait que euh, c'est normal puis c'est comprenable qu'elles aient été affectées euh, par la violence subie, que ce soit euh, la violence psychologique, émotionnelle, physique, sexuelle, financière, euh, toute cette sorte de, 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 de violence-là euh, qu'elle qu a, su, qu qu a subie pendant la, la relation, euh, après la séparation, c'est certain que ça continue à avoir un effet sur euh, la personne. Euh, puis pour moi, c'est primordial que, que les femmes obtiennent de l'aide, que ce soit du, du counseling, euh, d'autres services comme tels, pour faire en sorte qu'elle ne continue pas à être une victime, mais qu'elle devienne une survivante. Puis, pour moi, en ayant à discuter avec des, des, des clientes euh, lorsque j'étais avocate euh, en, en pratique, à un moment donné, je, je pouvais voir la différence. Puis en, encore, euh, encore euh, aujourd'hui, je, je peux voir la différence. Uh, I, I dealt with the women uh, who were victims of abuse. Uh, Since uh, which happened a, a long time ago, several years, and th they're still not a survivor. Uh, and th they're stuck uh, in the violence cycle and, and in the the uh, the, the victim uh, state, as if the abuse had happened only a few weeks ago or a few days ago, but it was several several years. And, and for me, it it's sad because the, the woman she cannot. Uh, go to the other step, the next step. And uh, I feel that it, it, is, it is even necessary uh, for services like those, whether it be uh, counseling or whether it be uh, um, coaching or, 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 or whatnot, uh, for the children as well who, who witnessed uh, the abuse. So to ensure that they can overcome any trauma that they have and that they do not adopt any of the abusive uh, behaviors. And uh, another aspect uh, that we cannot uh, ignore uh, is the professional help that the abusive men require uh, to assist them in uh, adopting a better coping mechanism and to, to stop uh, the violent cycle as well. Uh, because, and I have seen that in my practice as well over the years, uh, if, if, uh, if it is not uh, stopped, then 
there will be another one and there'll be another one and there, there'll be another one. And uh, unfortunately, it won't stop there either. Um, and, and I know that there has been a lot of um, research as well to the effect that if only the, 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 the woman victim gets help to help with her um, self-confidence and all of that, and the abuser, he does not have any help. She will not recognize, he will not recognize his spouse anymore if they continue to be together. And that will not help the situation as well. So um, as we have seen uh, in, in, the last, in the last years or, or that we know as a, as a society, um, there has been uh, much uh, help um, accessible, uh, either it be for um, women victim of abuse uh, who do not have a lot of fa financial means, but a lot of times uh, it's, it's more accessible or uh, faster uh, when the women have more means and, and uh, can help their children faster as well through uh, employ employment uh, services program or, or whatnot. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot has been done, but there is a, still a lot that can be done and will have to be done uh, to uh, help uh, the women victim of abuse and, and especially the ones who do not have the, the, um, the financial means. Donc, uh, en terminant, uh, même si beaucoup de services et, et de programmes uh, sont accessibles uh, pour les femmes victimes de violence uh, domestique, uh, c'est malheureusement plus difficile uh, pour celles uh, qui sont moins nanties, uh, qui ont uh, à attendre pour les, les services uh, publics, uh, qui sont souvent uh, surchargés, puis uh, même si les, les thérapeutes veulent, veulent tout faire et tout aider, euh, il y a mal, malheureusement beaucoup de, de listes d'attente euh, également. Donc, euh, c'était un peu ça qui était ma, ma, ma présentation. Euh, je, comme je vous ai dit, je, je suis ouverte à, à répondre à vos questions ou à initier des, des, des conversations euh, pour... Euh, uh, avec les, les autres panelistes, uh, so that uh, terminates my, my presentation per se, but I am open to any question or if uh, people want to uh, initiate uh, communications or conversations with the other panelists as well, um, I am open to that. Thank you so much. That was, that was excellent. I think it was very helpful to hear, you know, both sides of the bench of your, you know, in your experience and the changes that have happened over the, the period you've been practicing. Um, we do have some questions in the Q&A. So I think uh, there was an earlier question, which I'm, I'm going to get back to, but um, so more pertaining, I think, to the presentation you just gave, Madam Justice, as well as uh, Chantal Landry's. Um, one of them is a bankruptcy trustee who would like to know how he can um, better recognize signs of financial abuse. Now, I know that's not something we were specifically talking about today, but if any of you had uh, a thought about what some of the red flags are about financial abuse, that would be a, an interesting answer. I can start first and, and Mrs. Landry can uh, for sure, uh, or Mrs. Manuel uh, jump in afterwards, but uh, <laughs> I would say signs of uh, who who control the finances, uh, uh, in, in what names, for example, uh, were the, the debts or were the, uh, the bank accounts or, or, or things like that. Uh, uh, that I would say would be uh, the, the biggest flags I could see uh, in relation to, uh, to, to bankruptcy. Yeah, I would tend to agree, and I'm sure Lindsay may have a, a few more thoughts on this. Um, generally speaking, the financial uh, abuse is probably one of control and coercion. So I, I think if you are a banker or a trustee in bankruptcy, 
and you have a couple in front of you, you may not be able to identify clearly that there's domestic violence per se. It could very well be that just one partner seems to just always take charge of the situation. Um, but it might be of interest to you to speak to your couple separately and 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 see ask a few questions that you if if you do have concerns about any financial coercion or abuse um and and inform yourself of what community services are available to your particular clients and in, in the event that you might uh suspect uh, that there is uh any kind of uh, abuse but I, I it i understand that you are not necessarily in a position to um, declare that there is abuse, uh, but even sometimes just having pamphlets in your office about access to legal aid or access to, um, you know, just having a general community services pamphlets in, in your offices if you feel that you're facing couples that you suspect may be going through this kind of challenge. Lindsay, uh, what are your thoughts? I think you both answered it really well. It's really one of the ways that people use coercion and control. So there's often a lot of other signs um, of one partner controlling the other. The other resource that's available, not just to victims of intimate partner violence, but the domestic violence outreach services, they often will answer questions on different topics, and Public Legal Education and Information Service of New Brunswick, they have some great information on what domestic violence is, how to recognize it. They have a program, Safer Families, Safer Communities, have tips on how to talk to victims, what you can say. And I think Chantel's idea of having some pamphlets, maybe even if there's a woman's washroom or actually both um, washrooms, to have a poster there that someone could get a number very discreetly um, without showing their partner that they were trying to access help. That's, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, another question here, which uh, is actually one that I'm cu really curious about the answer to, because I wondered about this as well. So if a person is successful in getting an EIO with, um, exclusive possession of the marital home. The question is, uh, what is what is sort of the way of advising the client that unless something is filed under the Divorce Act or the Family Act, um, a Family Law Act, that the EIO, once it expires, it, it, there's nothing there then to secure that home for, for, the, for the victim. Um, and so the the, I guess the, the question is sort of how do we, how does legal aid help clients be more proactive in um, a, you know, following up with getting, getting the ball rolling on, on an order? And I guess B, the fact that marital property isn't part of the legal aid mandate, making sure they understand that for if there's marital property involved that they're going to need uh, a private lawyer as well to deal with that piece of it. So, so is there, yeah, maybe Chantal, if you could speak. Sure. Um, I had read the question and I was getting ready with my answer. So the, the mandate at legal aid, uh, we don't do final division of marital property and debt. It's, it's just a scope of service that we choose. We chose not to expand our services in, but we do under certain circumstances can request uh, exclusive possession of the home. So you can have your EIO, which is time limited with respect to your exclusive possession of the home. And under the right circumstances, come to legal aid. And I always encourage people to come to legal aid and apply as soon as possible because those EIOs do expire fairly quickly. Um, and if the circumstances are appropriate, that the lawyer can in their request under the Family Law Act, ask for uh, exclusive possession of the home. That is not a division of property. Uh, the, the party still maintain their interest in the, in the property that, that will have to be dealt with at a later date. Um, so we can offer a continuation of 
the exclusive possession of the home, except that we will not deal with the division, the final division of the property um, and debt that the client has to face. So uh, we will provide remedies for parenting orders, child support, uh, spousal support, and potentially exclusive possession of the home, uh, but the division of property would be done under a separate application or parallel to the hearing that we're holding, but they would have to have their own separate counsel for that. Thank you, that's a, a great answer. Um, I'm just typing an answer to, to one person because I happen to know the answer to that one. Um, but then we had an earlier question that was, I think uh, an interesting one, which is that um, it, it's about, I think what it's about is about uh, bridging silos. So the question is, is there an easier manner in which to create intersectionality between the assistance sectors? I think what the, the person asking means by intersectionality there is the bridging of silos. And to some extent, this project has been, you know, trying to grapple with how we do that with our community of practice. And I think, you know, we, we don't, there aren't easy answers, but I will ask all three of you if you have thoughts about um, bridging those silos and particularly keeping family law lawyers in mind who aren't necessarily, you know, equipped to, to know what's available and, and, you know, best practices for reaching out to other, other uh, community partners. So I'll, I'll let you tackle that one. If you don't mind, I can start and I can say one of the uh, great new things out is the Family Law Toolkit for Victims of Domestic uh, domestic Violence, for lawyers that have clients that are victims of domestic violence. There's also something in New Brunswick that I know exists in Nova Scotia and BC, and it's a coordinated community response. It's currently being rolled out across the province. It's not in all communities yet, but it is a protocol to deal with high risk cases and there are service providers from a variety of agencies, community-based agencies, um, health, social development, and uh, police and whatnot that come together to look at the case and really kind of problem solve uh, about what services are available and can be provided to this victim. And it is a consent-based process that someone would first need to be referred to it and then agree to be a part of it. So that's one thing, the coordinated community response, excuse me. That's excellent. And if, if we could uh, sort of get the link to that, I think that's something that would be very valuable for family law lawyers to know about in New Brunswick. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Um, I know that we uh, actively pursue at Legal Aid exactly uh, to expand our knowledge of community services that are available for our clients. In fact, it's part of one of our strategic projects uh, at Legal Aid over the next little while. Uh, some lawyers are really good in each region to know what is um, available in the community for their victims of, uh, of domestic violence. Uh, like uh, Justice Boudreau Dumas mentioned, she sat on a, uh, a transition home board, uh, obviously very well versed in what was in her community uh, as far as community services available to us. But we are actively um, ensuring that uh, not only our lawyers, but our intake officers, the people who actually receive the applications for clients uh, are aware of what's out in the community and available for clients so that uh, we are better equipped. Now we can't be everything to every client as we have stated several times, our lawyers are, have a job and it's specific to the legal remedy, um, but that doesn't prevent them from having, a, you know, at least a cursory knowledge of other services that are available in the community that when they're identifying a client with a housing issue, you know, they do not want exclusive possession of the home because that's where the violence occurs and that's where the perpetrator will find them, uh, but can give them some assistance in order to resolve their housing issue in the community. Uh, those aren't legal remedies, as we know, they are more social remedies. So we are actively trying to expand our knowledge in that area as well. I recall that when I was, uh, like I indicated in my presentation, uh, there was that that Papta Nadia or their partnership uh, 
for all the services in the community, which I do believe is very close to what Mrs. Uh, Manuel has indicated uh, has, is being put in place. But I found that to be very, uh, very informative because around the table, you had everyone, you had someone from social development, you had victim services, you had the, the police uh, sergeant. And so when you had an issue, for example, a victim of domestic violence who, who could not uh, uh, get through to the police, for example, or or something else, or get housing, or well, then you you knew who you could you could uh, talk to or or bring the the problem to the table. So um, partnerships like that are, are are very important. That's for sure. Well, that's great. Um, I'm not. I think we've covered all the questions that were in the Q and A. So we are a bit over time. So um, if there aren't further questions, I think maybe we should uh, let everybody go. But I really want to thank all three of you for taking the time to be part of this and the, the hard work you put into preparing for the presentations. I think there's just a wealth of information there. And uh, if people would like to review the webinar from the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center webpage, you can. Um, there was a request. Um, so, and I'll, I'll check on your permission, but to have the PowerPoint circulated with the attendees. So uh, we'll touch base with you about that. But if you didn't object to that, then I think that's probably something that we might be able to do as well because there was a, a lot in the PowerPoints. So again, thank you so much for attending. Um, and I look forward to seeing some more of you again, I hope when we, we do our next webinar, which will be probably in a few months. All right, have a great evening. <laughs>